Oh, once more, I did not take out my pointer. All right, so we stopped at the Amasis Painter last time. I love the Amasis Painter. He is so much fun. Lots of the potters in the potter's quarter um, were hacks. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the way it is in any art form. You have your C-grade flicks. You have your B-grade flicks. You have your blockbusters. You have your auteurs. Uh, in Athens in the 6th century BCE, vase painting was the mode of pictorial communication. Why is that? What were these vases used for? What are, what are the two vases that you see before you um, used for? Do you know? It's worth, it, it's worth knowing since knowing that has an effect on how you would read this object. You're both right. Storage of wine and water. <laughs> that is to say, it could be either one. It's for liquid. Um, now, generally, it would be, well, generally, this is the way it would work. The amphora would be for wine, and a jug, there would be a jug that would be water, and the crater would be the thing that you would pour the wine and the water in and mix the right amount. I know that sounds disgusting, but that's the way they did it. And maybe that's why their dinner parties could last all night long, because they did not keel over after the first couple of cups. Um, so this would be the, the wine bottle, in essence, but it's, it's pretty hefty. And you have to figure that if it was uh, holding the wine that was then mixed with water, this would be the single amphora at the dinner party. So there were your commonplace painted vessels, and there were your special order items, if you were going to have a big dinner party with the right people. And that vessel would be sitting in the middle of the room on a table, and everybody would see it. And the dining rooms, as we'll learn, people sat sort of arranged around the edges of the room, and that's why all the jars have, are painted on both sides. So you would have a picture whichever side you looked on. So some of the pictures are designed to impress, and some of the pictures are the same old story, and uh, like the birth of Athena, perhaps. And some of the pictures are for fun. And the Amasis painter really specialized in the last. He was one of the great painters of the Potter's Quarter. And he was, he was the sort of guy that you would want to have at your dinner party. He was, clearly, he was clearly tons of fun. His favorite deity, Dionysus, who is pictured regularly on his pots, including both of the amphora that you see here. This is not side A and B of the same pot. These are two different pots, as you can tell from the, from the neck, and actually they're slightly different shapes. Um, the Amasis painter's potter, who was the guy named Amasis, that is eight vases signed by Amasis, Amasis Apoyas and Amasis made me, meaning Amasis was the potter. Um, this potter, Amasis, was a very technically proficient potter and tweaked the shapes of the vessels in order to give his painter more flashy space to paint on. So uh, this, these particular, this particular type of amphora that was invented by the by Amasis, the potter of the Amasis painter, um, is uh, a little bit longer and a little bit broader so that there's more of a billboard for the Amasis painter to display his technique. Um, here you've got the face, just this large sort of mask-like face of Dionysus himself. How do we know it's Dionysus? Because he has grape leaves for his crown, um, adorably conveyed in red and black. And he's a very friendly Dionysus uh, with a big smile and cute round eyes and this funny nose and his locks of hair coming down. He looks like he's kind of gotten wet or just coming out of the shower. And he has grape tendril, grape um, leaves growing out of the sides of his hair. So he's lots of fun. And here, Dionysus, again, always recognizable not only by his crown, but by the fact that he's carrying the biggest wine cup possible. You can see in his hand, it's like the, what's that thing that you can get from 7-Eleven? Big gulp. This is the big gulp cantharos. 
And uh, he is extending his hand with his exceedingly long fingers. That's one of the hallmarks of the Amasis painter's style is very beautifully attenuated, graceful, long um, digits and appendages. So, uh, so you see Dionysus' outsized hand reaching for the hair that these two menads who are you know, the happy-go-lucky lady companions of Dionysus, those wild ones who you always want at a party, you always want a couple menads at a party. They definitely get the ball rolling. And these menads um, are, uh, they must be dancing, as you can tell from their fancy footwork. And we have to assume that they have their arms around each other. This um, particular pose was clearly a challenge for the Amasis painter, and he couldn't really quite <laughs> figure out how to loop their arms properly <laughs> around. <laughs> this is one of the problems with black figure. And in fact, the Amasis painter clearly realized that this was going to be a draftsman's challenge. And he did something very provocative and unusual, which is that um, he left the flesh of the ladies uncolored. So they are drawn in outline, as opposed to being painted over in white. That's usually the way the potters did it in black figure, was that the ladies were white. They had white paint. That's how you could tell among other ways, a lady from a man. And like with black figure, if you've got white paint, then you have to incise out all of the details. And uh, what the Amasis painter did here was just leave the figures the color of the pot itself. So they're not, they're not actually painted in there. And um, that was a good idea and interesting, but even so, not, not, not enough. Here is um, the belly, pa the panel of the, another one of these, what are called belly amphoras, and they're called belly amphoras because there's this great big painting on the belly of the amphora. This is one of my, my, one of my favorites. Uh, these are satyrs making wine, and they are having a blast, as you can tell. Um, there are the grapes being funneled into the mashing pit, and there's one satyr, woohoo, <laughs> who's mashing away at the grapes, and they're in an arbor. The grapes are, are growing over, and there are uh, satyrs. Here's a satyr picking a bunch of grapes ready to go, and uh, some of the wine that's already made is being poured into a large storage jar here at the end, and then this guy is, pl is playing music. It doesn't that what you want at a party is some music to help you along, and why should you not have fun at an event like this? And clearly these guys are having tons and tons of fun, as is evidenced by the adorable miniature frieze at the top with um, satyrs and ladies dancing. <laughs> they are so cute. You must love Attic Black Figure. There's nothing cuter in the whole wide world. She is my fave. <laughs> Although this, he's pretty good too. <laughs> the Amasis Painter painted a lot of different shapes. He was a very busy guy. We have over 75 pots from, that have been identified as pots by the Amasis painter. He was the first to paint scenes of everyday life. And not just regular, like people sitting around in their house, but real, real work, scenes of real work. This is one of the most famous. It's a little oil vessel called a lekathos. Like thus, just the Greek name for a little oil vessel that looks like this. And uh, as you can see, it is, or maybe you cannot really make out exactly what is going on here, um, it is women in their home at work in that category of activity that next to making dinner was the activity that must have occupied women more than any other. And that was making cloth in order to be able to make clothes blankets, rugs, all of the woven items that would have, as they say in Better Homes and Gardens, make a house a home. So, so uh, the process starts on one side with uh, spinning. This lady is drop spinning. So she's got a spindle with a whirl at the end of it. And she has a ball of unspun yarn up here. And she is using the spindle and the whirl to elongate the thread. Now, you remember seeing whirls from Zagora when we were back in the geometric era. And that was one of the ways that we knew that there were women working in various parts of the house. And that was one of the ways that we, for example, distinguished between the little building that we called a temple and the houses, because there were not domestic items 
in that. So here's the whirl at work. And uh, this lady has got um, a pile of yarn that is um, spun in her basket. And then as she moves, as you move around the vase from her, you have two women weaving that yarn into cloth. And here's a, a large standing loom. And uh, these two women are both apparently working at the same time. And the weights uh, here at the bottom are holding the warp of the, the warp threads of the loom taut. And then what's the upshot of all of this work? Well, you have, you have objects. And here is a rug or, or a blanket being folded and another pile of them here being folded. So you have the entire procedure of um, what women would have been occupied with for much of their day uh, on, on this phase. The Amasis painter was well known for, is well known for, that is we today recognize him as a master of matching the subject of what he paints to the shape of the pot that he puts it on. So here is uh, a little a uh, little sort of cruet or two cup wine jar or though although if you have the size cantharos that Dionysus had in that amphora this little cruet wouldn't do it it would probably only fill about half of it um, and here you have uh, an amphora and as you can see in both of these the amasis painter has very very carefully matched the style and subject to the shape of the vessel so on the olpe for example, are two men illustrating that point that you all read about in Hans von Wyss' art, nice article on uh, bearing iron. Uh, just two men dressed in the hymation, standing and talking, and one has his spear. And we're, we're still good. We're before 530. We're before 500. That, so this is exactly the sort of vase that um, is the subject of his article. And uh, just these two tall, slim figures perfectly match and perfectly fit into the small, vertical, slim space of the Olpe. Whereas on the amphora, where uh, the, the panel is, uh, is a broad, horizontal piece between the two handles, the Amasis painter has painted what is my all-time favorite horse scene. And I'm not really a big fan of horses. I mean, horse, I was not one of those little girls who loved horses when she was, when she was little. I didn't have those little plastic horse things. Um, but I love these horses. You have to love these horses. They, uh, first of all, are doing something very unhorse-like, which is sort of <laughs> prancing uh, not only on, in a completely un anatomically possible fashion, but completely in sync with one another, <laughs> with their, their back legs like, like elephants all standing on their back legs in a circus. Their back legs are all down, and their front legs are all forward, and their riders um, are in varying states, uh, vertical to, whoa, all the way um, pu pulling back. And Everything is completely and elegantly and perfectly aligned. Um, so so the, the tails are aligned with the manes, are aligned with the spears in each case. So you get this series of repeating diagonal thrusts. But my favorite detail is the dog. Do you see that the dog is just like the horses with his back legs down and his front legs forward? Oh, that's the cutest dog ever. OK. <laughs> All right. Who are the customers buying these vessels? Which category of regular citizen? What would that be? <laughs> so middle class, it's not that we don't think that there was a middle class. In the sense that we have, we have craftsmen, obviously now. We have, it's not just peasants and lords. Right, because we have people who are making things and obviously making money and making things. So while that's a narrow stratum, by no means the largest stratum, a middle class exists. So there, there's the great unwashed, 
there's the craftsman class, and then what else is there? So, the elites, right, is that what you're going to say? Yeah, the elites. Which of those three are the customers buying these vessels? The clue is what's on the vessels. So, so who are these guys? You just read a big article about this and wrote a re reading paper about it. Who are they? You in the pink all the way back there. Why? Yeah, they're dressed in the high mation, standing around with a spear that they absolutely don't need, talking, just standing around talking, because they have all the time in the world. Who has all the time in the world? The upper class, not us. We working. Them, the upper class. Who, who are these people on horseback? The, the, this, these are the upper classes. They are seeing themselves on these pots. The pots are being made to reify their own view of themselves, to reflect themselves back to them. So we have in the 6th century, in Attica, peasant farmers, no doubt, craftsmen, painters, potters, sculptors, among other sorts of crafts. Those are the crafts that, we, that we've been seeing evidence of. And then, and then elites. Elites are having dinner parties. They're ordering special vessels with themselves in the spotlight, standing around on horseback, um, or with great stories of heroes that they feel themselves to be the successors of. So like the Francoises with Peleus and Achilles. Those are the guys that the elites sort of, yeah, those are my people. And they are, if they have a lot of money, commissioning statues, sculptures, both for commemorative grave markers and for dedications in sanctuaries. What else are elites doing? How else, in other words, do they mark themselves off. What other activities besides the one that I the ones that I've just iterated that I hope you all have at the forefront of your brain and if you haven't you wrote down. What other sorts of things do members of the upper class in Greece or let's just say in Athens in the sixth century BCE occupy themselves with? Politics. Politics in uh, what are you getting at? What are you getting at? Um, there were the, some, some, some of the uh, representatives of the elites were tyrants? Or oh, were tyrants. We're going to get to that in about a minute. Hold that thought. You are correct. Oh, I was also going to uh, pick up on that. The, uh, large structures. They, um, well, they're, they're probably sponsoring the construction well, of. Yeah, that's, is that what you mean? Yes. They're sponsoring the construction of, um, they're underwriting buildings of temples and, and making of sculptures. But I'm talking about, you know, like for example, now I'm sure that none of you waste your time doing this thing that I do religiously every Sunday, which is read the style section of the Sunday New York Times, which is my fave. And in the style section, which is like a little cultural palimpest, so it's really very interesting. Don't you agree? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jane and I are as one on this. Um, in the style section, there's something that is kind of fascinating. There's a page that's devoted to society events, like ball. I mean, what used to be called balls, like debutante balls and balls. But, but now they're all for fundraising. But that's just 
so that society people can feel great about getting completely dolled up in ridiculously expensive clothes and going out and hanging out with each other at ridiculously posh places. And then they say, well, I'm raising money for whatever, fill in the blank. And they are, and that's great. But this is, you know. So, so one of the things that you might say today that marks people of that very nosebleed upper class stratum is uh, our balls. Um, lavish parties. So that's what I'm getting at. What are some of the other kind of um, activities that members of the upper class in Athens in the 6th century might engage in? Let's, let's move back a century. 7th century. You might need to look at your notes. Do you need to have a little chat? Have a little chat. Take 30 seconds. You know the answer to this. Okay, did you think of something? Did you think of something? Um, <gasps> Thank you. Like funeral games. Yes, like funeral games. Exactly. And in the early part of the 6th century, those were still going on. This was one of the ways that elites uh, marked out who they were, advertised who they were. And there really must have been a fair number of these things going on regularly. I mean, people die. And with each elite death and funeral, there would have been games. So you're looking at here a fragment of a Dinos by Sophilos. We met Sophilos last time, the first Attic vase painter to sign his work. Uh, Sophilos painted this Dinos. We know because he signed it. Uh, Sophilos McGrathson, right there. And he wanted there to, he wanted it to be very clear what he was documenting, so he labeled that as well, Patroclus Atla, which means uh, the competition for Patroclus, or the funeral games. That's the funeral games, Atla. Competition, which of course is one of those hallmarks of Greek culture. And so this is um, a Dinos that purports to represent the funeral games of Patroclus, which of course was one of the events that we also saw in the Francois vase. But this cannot be the funeral games of Patroclus because we have, <laughs> we have people on bleachers. Do you see? We have, we have some bleachers that have been set up. And here are the two teams of horses, one white, one black. Some things never change. And uh, so what must this be? This must be an elite funeral game in the Agora, and it is being... Uh, advertised as a way, or its doppelganger is, the funeral games of Patroclus, but it must have been a big pot that was made and painted as perhaps a prize in those funeral games that were being held for some, some elite member. This is early 6th century. You still see here on this, it's too bad we don't have more of the fragment, but here on the frieze below, the top frieze, one of these eastern processions of uh, lions, like um, how the Attic painters borrowed from Corinth, and uh, another one of these uh, processions of uh, large scary creatures, sphinxes, and lions up here on the top of the rim of the Dinos. But clearly, this is the scene that really matters. And we even have Achilles must be in there somewhere because he's li there's a label for him. The, um, I have to say in passing, one of the most charming things about Sophilos is that he doesn't get his spelling correct regularly. <laughs> oh, you might, no spell check back then. <laughs> Writing was clearly a brand new shiny toy <laughs> that he was taken out for a test drive and didn't always get it right. And um, again, you remember the, the energetic and very fun hand gestures on um, some of the figures on the Francois Vase, especially my favorite, that guy from the Freeze of Theseus and Ariadne coming back, who's clutching the ground. Here you see um, people with 
at like rubber arms, very long <laughs> arms, outstretched, yay, go, go, <laughs> urging on their, their, <laughs> their compatriot. That is so funny. It's like somebody has <laughs> a stick with a hand at the end of it that they must be holding out because nobody has ar arms that long. I mean, nobody, this teeny weeny little size has arms out. Very cute. All right. Where are these events taking place, these funeral games? Where are the cemeteries of Athens? There's a big hint up here on the screen. <laughs> the Dipolon. Dipolon is one of the big cemeteries, the Dipolon Oinakui that I just showed you, the little jug with the For He Who Dances Most Gaily inscription on it. That's where it comes from. That's why it's called the Dipolon Oinakui, because it's an Oinakui that comes from the Dipolon. And where else? Where's the other cemetery in Athens in the 8th and the 7th and the early 6th centuries BC? The Keramicus is the Dipolon. The Dipolon and the Keramicus is one place. Sorry about that. It's one of those aggravating little things about Greece is not only are there too many vowels and weird consonants, but some places have two different names, just to make your life even worse. Sorry about that. What's the other burial ground in Athens in this time? The Agora. Right. Now, back to tyrants. So, okay, that was longer than a minute. I'm sorry about that. Um, in the 8th and the 7th and the early 6th century, there was no government in Attica. There was no government in any of the Greek cities. There were rich people who got richer. There were more of them. I mean, people, more people were born. There were, there were wealthy families. They were wealthy by virtue of owning a lot of land. That's how they were wealthy. Beginning in the early 6th century in many Greek cities, not just Athens, but Corinth and, and Sparta and Thebes and, and cities in East Greece um, and, and some of the colonies in, in West Greece and in, in Magna Graecia in Italy, um, there, that system, which was really no system, it was sort of a large agreed upon group of guys, uh, broke down or was um, uh, slightly reconfigured. And individuals who were aristocrats, who were members of the elite in each of these cities, seized power. That is to say, they organized a, a big clutch of guys who agreed that they would be supportive of whoever it was that was interested in holding on to power. And they would in that kind of medieval European way, you know, sort of storm a meeting with, uh, with everybody with their weapons and say, you know what, I'm the new boss in town. These guys we call tyrants. We call them tyrants because that's the Greek name for them. Tyrannos is a Greek word, and it means a person who seizes power illegally. It does not mean a bad person or a brutal person, and tyranny does not mean a horrible, repressive system that everybody can't wait to get out from under. It might, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It simply means that one person has, by fiat, put himself in charge. In the early 6th century, around 560, in Athens, in Attica, actually, since Attica and Athens are as one, Attica is really the hinterland of Athens, that person was Pisistratus. Now, you have sort of two options once you take over. You can exploit everything for your own good, or you can try to change some of the system to bring more people, um, you know, not exactly power, but um, some semblance of participation and so some, some additional feelings of participation and control. Pisistratus was the latter sort of tyrant. And the first thing he did was something so clever. He banned elite funeral games as being displays that accentuated disparities of wealth and so made people unhappy. And because he knew that competition and games remained fundamental parts of Greek life, he replaced them with a new festival, 
a festival that was called the All Athens Festival, which of course sounds better in Greek, because everything sounds better in Greek, and that is, it is called the Pan Athenea. And he instituted a number of events at the Pan Athenea. Among them was a public recital of the epics of Homer. Among them were contests. The same sort of contests that had been part of elite funeral games were now games in the uh, service of this festival. And lastly, what does every festival need? A parade. You have to have a parade. And the parade route, or the pan Athenaic way, started at the gates of the city, the Dipolon, and went through the Agora and up to the Acropolis. That is the two main areas where there had been elite funerals and burials and the staging of games were subsumed into this festival processional. Burials stop. We have no more burials in the Agora after the early 6th century BC, so we have archaeological confirmation of the literary evidence about the original date of the Panathenaea. Sir? Um, what do they go around for this path? <gasps> oh, yeah. Um, that's actually uh, a hill and a little sanctuary. There's, a, there's an old sanctuary of Aphrodite there. And in this reconstruction, you, don't, you can't really see the hill, but... Yes, yes, good question. That looks like it's unnecessary. <laughs> Detour ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, so there's the Panathenaic Way. Um, the cemeteries uh, cease, and uh, here it is, the Panathenaic Pan Way in the Athenian Agora, with people walking on it up towards the Acropolis, and uh, what? Uh, you need is something worth going to when you get to the top of the Acropolis. You need a temple. You need a temple. And in fact, there is evidence for a temple in the 6th century on the Acropolis. It's not that building that you see sticking up. It's that, <laughs> which is still visible today and looks like this. Um, now this was uncovered by, by excavation in, in part, but parts of this would have, been, would have been visible. These are the foundations of the first temple to Athena on the Acropolis in Athens, built in the middle of the 6th century BCE by Pisistratus. Now we've got the transposition of elite funeral games into games for the Panathenaea. We have the festival. We have the parade, the procession. We have the temple on the top of the Acropolis to which the procession wends its way. And there's just one more thing we need. We need prizes. You cannot have games and competitions without awards. How would you know that you'd won? What would you look back on? What would you take home? Just like today at the Olympics. So uh, there had been prizes handed out in elite funeral games based on, I mean, how elites got the idea to do that was that they'd read it or they'd heard it in, from the Iliad. The story in uh, Iliad 23 about the funeral games of Patroclus, we've got these giant bronze um, cauldrons, these tripods. Uh, that is the detail, of course, of this fragment of the Francois vase. And um, so, so Pisistratus needed to have prizes. But there were a lot more games. There were a lot more competitors. And this was a city-sponsored project. So. You couldn't be handing out bronze cauldrons to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. I mean, that would just, that would deplete the treasury, such as it was, meaning there was no treasury. It was, there wasn't a treasury yet, so it was just Pisistratus himself, probably. Uh, the most lucrative and um, famous product of 
Athens and Attica is olive oil. Lots and lots and lots of olive trees. And olive oil was a very important commodity in antiquity. You used it to light lamps. You, you used it as shower gel. You rub it on yourself, and then you'd, you'd scrape off with, a, with this metal thing that was called a strigil. And that is how you got clean. And then you had that nice fruity smell. <laughs> um, olive oil was used for cooking. Olive oil was used for everything. And uh, Attica, the hills around Athens especially, there are lots and lots of olive trees and lots and lots of olive oil. So jars of olive oil were the prize at the pan athenate Games. The competitions at the pan athenate Games were very similar in some ways to the competitions that had already been commonplace in elite funerary games. So horse racing, that, that love of horsey stuff, again. Um, but also, lots of events that were now canonical parts of athletic competitions known from the Olympic Games. The Panathenaic Games were modeled on the Olympic Games, which had been going on for a couple hundred years by now. And that olive oil came in jars specially made and decorated to be prize jars for the games. And those black figure potters in the Athenian Potter's Quarter were hired to make prize jars for the games. On one side of a Panathenaic prize amphora uh, was Athena herself, the symbol of the city. Athena and uh, usually an inscription on the side that read, from the games in Athens. And then on the other side of the jar, this is so cute. <laughs> on the other side of the jar is a picture of the competition that you won a prize in. So this is side B of a Panathenaic amphora. And obviously, the person who won this amphora won in the foot race, because that is what is depicted. So you have these very, very cute um, runners hustling along. And so we've got, uh, we've got lots of different events, some easy to recognize uh, wrestling, some weird that you would not think would be a very good idea for an event, hoplite runners, which means you have to run fully, fully dressed for battle, shield, helmet, spear. That would really get in the way, wouldn't you think? <laughs> this guy's obviously the winner. Here I am. Here's the, um, <laughs> the, the judge. And here's the prize. What, I mean, it just as it's depicted, this, would, this is the prize. So this is kind of funny um, because, because the hoplite running event is, must have been a holdover from uh, elite funerals and funerary games and at which a, a cauldron, this uh, highly elevated cauldron on the world's tallest cauldron legs, um, <laughs> is depicted as, as the prize. And then um, this totally weird, on, only in Greece sort of competition, um, this thing that's called the Pankration. The Pankration, Pankration is uh, a combination of wrestling and boxing. And basically, it's like a street fight uh, where you're not allowed to pick up a brick. That is, you just have your bare hands, but anything goes. It's a brawl. I think that would be the best translation of pankration, is brawl. Um, it means, it's a Greek word that means all force or all strength, something like that, pankratos. Uh, and the laurel wreath is about to be handed to this, to this guy who's about to you know, totally incapacitate this guy um, here. All right. So, uh, so you... Um, uh, compete in the Panathenaea and you win a prize and because now it is the Panathenaea, meaning all Athens games, anybody can compete, it's not always the case that only the wealthy compete and only the wealthy win. So the wealthy, and isn't this the problem of totally rich people in every place and time? They keep 
running out of or being denied ways to differentiate and advertise themselves. And then they must think harder. Now what can I do to show off? This, this is, see, we should feel sorry for these folks. <laughs> and so uh, what are the people who are uh, the elites in Athens in the middle of the 6th century going to start to do? OK, they can still put those big statues on their graves, and they can still hire potters to make extremely elaborate vessels for their dinner parties. Um, and the, another thing that they can do is to start putting elaborate sculptural dedications in the new biggest and brightest sanctuary in all of Attica, and that's on the Acropolis of Athens. And indeed, lots of archaic statues, especially from the middle towards the, to the second half of the 6th century, have been found um, on the Acropolis. And this is an old picture from uh, the, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, so over 100 years old, of um, German excavators coming across what was a huge pit into which a mass of dedicatory sculpture that had been on the Athenian Acropolis had been put. Um, this mass of dedicatory sculpture had been put in a, in a huge cleanup after the Acropolis had been burned by the Persians, which is an event that we'll get to in about two weeks. Uh, so, uh, so this sculpture is fantastic, of course, just gorgeous, um, and is all in the guise of personal dedicatory sculpture. So this fellow here um, is uh, bringing an animal for sacrifice. He's called this, the statue is called the Muscophoros, which means ram bearer because um, that's what he's bringing and it's so you have to imagine that his eyes would have been inlaid so they were not these large sockets that look like one of those black velvet paintings of those kids with gigantic eyes uh, but he's very he's really adorable and he has his nice archaic smile and his very obedient small animal is um, posing by you can just imagine the photographer saying, look this way, smile. <laughs> Both animal and man turn their heads face forward. How big are these things? Oh, this is, um, he's about uh, five foot six. So they're pretty good size. Mm -hmm. And he has, he has a tunic on. As you can tell, it's wrapped very tightly around him, and you can just see the seams. But uh, obviously, the sculptor or maybe the patron who commissioned it was anxious to uh, make sure that the physique of this guy be clear, despite the fact that he was clothed. He's clothed, um, maybe in part because he's a dedication of a, somebody who was m more modest than the normal run of Greeks at this time. Another of these beautiful, famous dedications from um, the Acropolis at this time, the Rampant Horseman. Um, this is a great story, actually. So he's on a horse, a uh, guy on a horse, and he has this beautiful... Um, elaborate do, uh, both beard and hair, spent a lot of time at the beauty salon this day before he had everything done. Um, back in the um, 19th century, when there was a lot of sort of lifting of objects from the Acropolis by members of various foreign missions and objects that found their way to museums far away from Greece, um, the, this head was uh, found its way to Paris, wh where it is today, in the Louvre. The body uh, stayed in Athens. Um, and a scholar, a, a, great, a great young scholar, British scholar named Humphrey Payne in the 1920s um, or 1930s was in the Louvre and looked at the head and recognized the break pattern and recognized that it was the head of this torso. And he persuaded the officials at the Louvre to make a plaster cast and send it to, and he took it to Athens and they, they put it on the torso and it fit. Um, so now there's a plaster torso in the Louvre so that you get the whole statue and a plaster cast of the head in Athens. <laughs> it would be nice if they were both in one place at one time, but anyway. Um, Okay, 
the most uh, amazing of all of the dedications on the um, Acropolis in the latter years, or the second half of the 6th century, are the girls, the Cori. And there are, I don't know, about 30 of them, minimally. Um, and they're all decked out, and there's all different sorts of them. And there's so many of them that they have numbers. Um, so this is 594, 675, and 673. Um, I know that Mr. Pedley in his book, he loves these things. Oh, God, I cannot. I'll never forget how much time we had to spend on these. When I was a student, we had to talk about the drapery. We had to talk, well, we had to talk about everything, the hairstyle, whatever. Anyway, um, these are kind of smallish. They're about uh, uh, four and a half to five feet. Um, and I think you can um, imagine them not only as dedications, um, and not even necessarily as dedications from people who are prize winners, but you know, just dedications from wealthy families. That is, dedications on the Acropolis, perhaps in context with the Panathenaea, or perhaps not, um, became very, very popular for members of the upper class in Athens at this time. Uh, here, this might be the lady who's on the cover of many of your copies of Mr. Pedley's book, so I show you her. Um, she's uh, one of the most famous of the Cori to have been found on the Acropolis because she's in a different kind of dress. So it doesn't really take much to get archaeologists all exercised about something. <laughs> this is one of those things. Woo! She, instead of a chitin, she's wearing a peplos, um, which is why she's called the peplos Cori, because she's the only one wearing a peplos. And she's very nice. She's particularly well preserved, and a lot of her original paint is preserved. So much original paint is preserved on her that I'm going to share with you something that is shocking and horrifying. So it's good that you are all sitting down. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, this is truth in advertising, um, or as one of my compatriots in um, graduate school said when we were comparing notes after we both first got jobs and we started teaching, and she said, have you let them in on the great paint secret yet? <laughs> I said no. <laughs> but then I started to feel guilty about that because it's true. These things were not all plain white. They were painted, and they look so much worse. But um, yeah, like as in no comparison. But this is, this is the way they would have actually looked. They were all, they were all dolled up. And they, it probably wouldn't have been so shocking in the bright light of the Greek sun. You know, it's like, like I don't really know exactly why this comes to mind. Like Hawaii, for example, where everybody wears bright colors. You know, it's very, it's a bright place. And then you need bright colors or else you just fade. You don't really show up. So maybe you can imagine it like that. All right. In the Potter's Quarter, um, Amasis was not actually the star. The Amasis painter was not actually the star. There was a, po a painter and potter named Exekius who was regarded um, probably by his contemporaries, uh, and the, the evidence for that will be revealed momentarily, and certainly by all modern um, students, scholars, and lovers of ancient Greek art, as the master, the maestro, the Michelangelo, the Leonardo da Vinci, the you name it, top dog in, uh, in the Potter's Quarter, Exekius. Um, is probably the son of Nearchus. You may remember the giant Cantharos by Nearchus that was dedicated on the Athenian Acropolis, the beautiful Cantharos that showed Achilles and his horses quietly standing. And I read from you the passage um, from Iliad Book 9 at the end where the horses of Achilles are given voice by Hera and speak to him and say, you will die, but it won't be because we didn't do our best, but because it is your fate. So Nearchus was a serious guy, and Exekius, his son, inherits that. He um, slightly modifies the shape of the pot even more to make it an even more uh, appropriate billboard for his artistry. And he frequently does very um, innovative stuff. Like So for example, you see here comp comparing the cavalcade amphora by the Amasis painter and uh, this amphora by, by Exekius, that Exekius has eschewed lots of black on his pot. So you don't have, as you do here, where there's a single spotlight on the panel. Here you've got the whole pot essentially left as a field 
to be decorated. And then these, these elegant um, curly cues so that nothing, um, nothing is, co is competitive with the, um, with the scene. The scene here is uh, one of those heart-wrenching pivotal moments that Greek myth is so fond of. Uh, the hero Achilles, in one of his earlier exploits, this is one of the ways that he became a great big hero, um, so this is pre-Trojan War, went off with a group of Greek soldier, journeyman, hero guys, to fight this uh, group of women called Amazons. And the leader of the Amazons was Penthesilea, and Achilles himself, as befits a hero and a queen, it has to end up with the two of them locked in combat. And as befits a hero as opposed to a queen, he's going to win. That's Greek myth for you. And, and Greek culture and society <laughs> to go with it. And uh, yet, in the story, what happens is, as he is plunging the sword into her breast, their eyes meet and they fall passionately in love, but it is too late. <sighs> and that's what's going on here. And we know it's him because it's signed Exegius Poison. Ah, yes, and here is the detail. And you see, <gasps> they are staring at each other. <sighs> and they're labeled. I mean, in case you just, I guess, I guess there's always the worry that you're going to have the odd Joe at the dinner who's not going to know the story. So they're labeled Achilles, Penthesilea and the signature. <sighs> Exequius, yes, Jane. I have a real quick question. Um, what was so shocking to me is when you sh showed the Corey, the Peplos Corey, and then we went back to the vases, and wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be a natural thing to, if, if all those statues were colored so garishly to put some of that color on their vases and we don't see that? Well, there's added color on the vases, but not too much. There's red, sometimes there's purple, there's white. But we don't see, I mean, it's pretty neutral colors, and we don't it see is. any of that. That's because, the field, that's because the field of the vase is red. Okay. So a lot of color, you know, it would be like if you've got a room that's already painted a certain color, there's a limit to how many other colors you can slap on top. Okay. Greek painters were aware of this. There um, are two answers to your, um, to your, to your larger question. One is, uh, this is not the only kind of painting. There's also monumental painting. That is, there was wall painting. And wall painting was different and would have been more like sculpture. The second is, well, I'm not showing you any because we don't actually have any from the 6th century that's worth showing to you and can't show you everything. Um, in the 5th century, which we'll get to, um, there's another kind of vase painting that's developed that's called white ground. And what the attic painters do is they actually put white all over the surface of the pot. And that way, they can put a lot of added color. And as we'll see when we get to white ground, a lot of it is super ugly. So it turns out that this was a good idea not to do that with the, with the, with the red um, background of the attic phases. But that, I think, probably answers your question. So they, in other words, they were aware of this discrepancy themselves. Um, Exequius uh, favored um, lots of serious scenes, and he painted on demand. That's obvious. So the fragment that you see here um, is from a plaque. It's called a pinox, a plaque, which was made for a funeral. And it shows the successor to all of those geometric men and women with their triangular bodies and their hands like this on the top of their heads, all those mourning women that we remember seeing. And now we see with the added detail of um, uh, color and incision, that the black figure technique allows um, more detail. And this is uh, such, a, such an e e emotive, evocative scene, even on this small fragment, made most clear, I think, by her hair. I just feel when I look at this figure, she's, she's clearly in mourning. She's in despair. She doesn't know what to do. And she... She, she hasn't bathed. She's unkept. She's, she's in such distress. And with a few strokes, Exequius conveys that. Exequius has a number of masterpieces that convey 
pivotal scenes in Greek myth. One pivotal scene in Greek myth, a scene that resonated for um, many of the cultural reasons that, we, that we've been talking about over and over, uh, one pivotal event, was the one that you see depicted here on the field of battle at Troy. Eventually, Achilles goes to war. And he, as is prophesied, fulfills his fate and is killed. And it falls to the second most honored and strong of the Greek soldiers at Troy, who is Ajax, to carry his body off the field. And what you see is Achilles being carried by Ajax. And with the detail available to the black figure artist, uh, the death, the, 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 the limp body and, and state of Achilles is conveyed. Look at his hand here with his fingers loose and crumpled and his eye is closed as opposed to Ajax carrying him. And, a, and, and the figure of Ajax has a small, um, just a little incision right here next to his nose he, like he's holding tight, like he's grimacing. He's got a heavy weight on his back. It's not just Achilles, who was the largest and the strongest of the Greeks, but it's Achilles in all his armor, with his shield, his helmet, his shield over, over his back. And uh, so it's a heavy weight. And the bodies are, I mean, look at, look at these quadriceps, will you? <laughs> That's Achilles. And Ajax. There's a, a view that's a little bit um, better, but I just wanted to show you that other view because you can get such a close-up detail of, um, of the incision on the pot. After the death of Achilles on the field, it fell to a council of the Greeks to award his armor. It should have gone to Ajax. Ajax was acknowledged to be, as I said, the strongest and best of the warriors of the Greeks, but it did not. In council, the leaders, including Agamemnon, decide to give the armor of Achilles to Odysseus. And Ajax takes this as a message that he has been rejected and dishonored. And in the story, he commits suicide. And that's the scene that you see on this amphora. But you do not see the event. Think about the Francois Vase or the Amasis Painter. What you see very frequently is action. Painting a scene of action, of doing. This is a scene of quiet. This is the moment before. Early on, or another painter might have shown the crumpled body of Ajax already dead on its side. Exegius has chosen to show this fraught and tortured moment, this moment of planning. You see that Ajax's eye is wide open. He is carefully planting his sword in a mound of dirt, and then he is going to fall upon it. His shield and helmet and spears are at the side, and as if already in mourning, a palm tree on the left of the panel has its branches hanging down. Ajax has taken off all of his clothes so that nothing will get in between him and his choice. Is it of his armor or is it of uh, Achilles' armor? This is his armor. It has to be his armor because he was not given the armor of Achilles. Odysseus was given the armor it of Achilles. It just looks like his the same shape that, well, I think it was not the same person. Um, oh, because it has a Medusa on it? Yeah. And this has a Medusa on it. But a lot of Greek shields had Medusa. That's a common shield emblazoned. All of the shields of Athena have Medusa. She's common because the story, of course, of Medusa is that if you see her face, you turn to stone, which is why Perseus chops her head off. Um, so, yeah.
the highlight of attic black figure vase painting, the masterpiece of Ezekias, is the painting, is the vase that you see here. We know, again, it's by him, it's signed. This shows a moment that doesn't come from any story. Ezekias makes this up. He takes the characters in their well-known personae, and he puts them in a new position. They're playing a game. They're playing dice. They lean intently over the game board. Ajax and Achilles, they're labeled, so that there can't be any doubt. Aantos, Achilles. And they're calling out their roles. I mean, the role of the die. So Achilles says tessera, which means four. And Ajax says tria which means three. Once again, Achilles, just by one, is the victor. Their heads are almost equal, but Exekius has very carefully kept Achilles' helmet on his head while the helmet of Ajax is here on the side, and so the figure of Achilles dominates the scene. They hold their spears, although they don't need them. They're in the confines of the panels of the amphora, which appears to be set up like the sides of a tent. There's giant shields leaning on the sides of the panel. And the incredible amount of filigree and detail on the cloaks makes it seem as if they are lit from within. They are mortals but here seem divine. Although, they both will die. One on the field of war, one by his own hand, too young, and will live on only in song. So this light moment, this game, is just a stopping point for the larger fate that, as one of the poets that you have on your sheet will say, the spinning destinies have in store for them. Have a great weekend. Have a good time next Tuesday. Don't come here. I won't be here. See you a week from Thursday. Nope.